Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this special focus on electric vehicle and battery supply chains as part of Automotive Logistics and Supply Chain Live. For those of you just joining us, I'm Christopher Ludwig, Editor-in-Chief here at Ultima Media and Automotive Logistics. Electric vehicles have been one of the few growth segments in the crisis-hit automotive industry this year, especially in Europe, where sales have continued to surge despite a disastrous falls in, fall in overall vehicle sales. With new vehicle emissions and changing technology, we expect ongoing rises in EV sales and production at the same time as the industry faces a protracted recovery in the coming year and indeed over the coming decade as well. The electric vehicle and battery supply chain is becoming especially strategic as OEMs strive to meet demand in a market with incentives and short on inventory in some cases. In particular, managing the battery supply chain has become especially critical as OEMs, battery makers, and startups secure supplies and set up new facilities. To share some insights on EV demand and battery supply today is Daniel Harrison, our automotive analyst who leads on our business intelligence research here at Ultima Media, which includes producing global demand and production forecasts, financial analysis, and insights into the changing regulations influencing the automotive sector, including in areas like electrification. I wanna hand over to Daniel now for a 15 or so minute presentation, after which we'll come right back and we'll talk through some of the major trends and developments impacting the EV supply chain. So thanks, Daniel. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chris. So yes, as Chris said, we'll cover the automotive battery electric vehicle supply chain. Um, it's a very complex area, but let's start with an overview of electric vehicles and where they're at right now. So. We begin with the, the global context. So we have total vehicle sales, uh, including all types of vehicles, are expected to fall by around 20% in 2020, thanks to the COVID crisis. So it's a pretty drastic impact to the industry. However, EVs themselves are actually uh, countering the market. So we have a 20% you know, growth, despite that context of overall falling sales. So EVs are drastically increasing market share within that, that situation. Now, this um, demand for, for batteries, of course, is primarily from electric vehicles because they have the largest batteries. Typically, you're looking at, uh, in an electric vehicle, around 50 kilowatt hours capacity. A uh, plug-in hybrid usually has around 10 kilowatts. And a hybrid electric vehicle, such as a Toyota Prius, has a very small battery of around one kilowatt hour. So we can largely disregard that because that's not regarded as a, a plug-in electric vehicle. We're mainly focusing here on electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or electrically charged vehicles, as they're also sometimes grouped together as. But of course, this rapid growth in battery demand creates enormous challenge in challenges to um, building efficient supply chains. You know, imagine ramping up those chains at 20% per year. That's a huge undertaking. Now, companies will obviously have to remain very nimble and innovative to thrive within that situation. But of course, the, the growth in electric vehicles this year has actually started to increase beyond uh, what we were previously expecting pre-COVID. So, Again, there's a, a huge change there that the supply chains have to adapt to. And of course, successful EV sales growth is very reliant upon those battery supply chains. There are specific examples we've seen where um, uh, electric vehicle sales have actually been hindered and held back by shortages, which is a real tragedy in terms of not only the sales of those vehicles, the prospects of the company, but also the transition to electrification. So therefore, you can regard efficient battery supply chains very much as a key competitive advantage in the industry to, to gaining market share, to achieving sales. So it's a critical business issue. So let's look at the, the sort of upstream element of this, the actual lithium battery demand and capacity. So this is a forecast we've produced in-house um, for 2020 we predict global capacity for lithium plants will reach around 400 gigawatt hours. However, the uh, demand for electric vehicles is much less than that. It's around 180 for passenger vehicles and around 18 for commercial electric vehicles. 
you may ask why that was there such a big gap between um, those figures and the, the capacity well that's the theoretical capacity um, that the plants could operate at but don't um, as headroom should we say um, but what's also noticeable about this graph is the the dominance of electric vehicle um, battery demand growth uh, even up to 2030, it accounts for around 70 to 80 percent of demand. The remainder being consumer electronics and energy storage systems. So, moving on to the next slide. The um, on the supply side, um, it's very much the case that investment in lithium plants continues um, despite the COVID crisis, as they're very much taking a long-term view around. Uh, investment cycles. Yes, this is a terrible situation, but they're looking three, five, even ten years ahead. Some of these plants are, are huge undertakings to develop. And as we said, potentially the capacity will reach 400 gigawatt hours in 2020. However, the automotive uh, demand, as, as it indicated, was expected to be around 180 gigawatts uh, this year. And that's that's you know, potentially across all sectors, the the capacity is such an issue that they're they're building uh, potentially a larger um, potential for for battery cell uh, production, but are not actually going to fully use it yet. But they will do. So many of the plants are being built uh, with potential to expand. So, 180 gigawatts, as I said, is is likely to be produced for electric chargeable vehicles and that equates to around 5.5 million ECVs, EVs and PHEVs combined globally in 2020. On the demand side, um, of course EV sales are growing at around 20% a year and, and expected to continue to do so over the next um, 10 years or so. So it's a fairly uh, consistent growth. Um, however, it's not quite that simple because the actual uh, capacity of the batteries fitted to each vehicle is also growing. As we know, the, the batteries fitted are growing every year as battery prices fall, and that's around 5% a year. So what that means for, for uh, logistic plants ultimately is that uh, they need to grow in terms of gigawatt hour capacity by around 25% per year. So that's what we're forecasting for lithium plants. Okay, so let's move on from there. Now, pre-COVID, the drivers of electrification were fairly clear and straightforward. We had the, the emissions regulations, particularly in Europe and China, forcing OEMs to invest and, and produce and, and actually sell. That's the critical element. So it only applies if they actually sell the vehicles. And in response, OEMs have put on to the market very large numbers of low emission vehicles um, for consumers. Now, the um, issue now is that we have a situation where um, it's very much a virtuous circle, really, if you think about it. Um, the economies of scale often have a situation where um, they are producing uh, falling battery prices. That leads to uh, ultimately a price reduction on the EVs compared to ICE vehicles. And this allows OEMs to fit high capacity batteries as we're seeing on an al almost yearly basis, which increases the range of the vehicles. And this reduces the range anxiety for the consumer and the conf confidence in EVs, which ultimately feeds back into growing sales volumes and potential economies of scale. So it's a, it's a perfect sort of virtuous circle that. Um, but post COVID, the drivers, those remain of course, those previous drivers, but in addition to that, there are additional factors such as the automotive stimulus packages have even more starkly incentivized low emission vehicles in particular. Uh, that's especially the case in Germany, for example, where there's no extra incentive for ICE vehicles. Um, but this this is in particular the case for uh, France, Spain, Germany, and Italy, uh, but not the UK or the US, interestingly. China 
has extended its existing EV subsidies, but will phase them out over the next two years. So that, that remains to be seen. And that is a factor in all of these stimulus packages, how long they'll be in place. Now, the virtual circle now is somewhat changed. Um, we've seen a slight trend for consume commuters to shift from public transport to personal transportation for fear of uh, getting infected with the COVID virus. Um, and this has led to um, increased sales of new and, and used vehicles. Um, and especially so in congested cities where there's a public transport system. And of course, in, in many cities around the world, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are often exempt or, or get subsidies uh, because of the low emission zones or congestion zones. And of course, EVs uh, are very well suited to the, the shorter distances uh, that you see in, in city driving. So again, it's kind of a virtuous circle there. Okay, so let's move on to our forecast for Europe. Now, as you can see from the, the forecast, we have uh, quite a stark drop in volumes for 2020, as you'd expect um, for uh, sales, given the, the COVID crisis. Um, in fact, I think it's, it's around 25% uh, down from 2019 volumes. Um, but nonetheless, you can see EV and PHEV volumes uh, growing strongly nonetheless. And over the next decade, we expect the, the market share for these segments to grow substantially um, and eventually overtake ICE vehicles in beyond the next decade and into the 2030s. So moving on to the next slide. Um, Short-term outlook was very interesting. For the first half of 2020, electrically charged vehicles, i.e. EVs plus PHEVs, actually grew by over 40% in sales volumes. However, that's within the context of overall vehicle sales falling by 38%. So it's a very stark shift to electric vehicles within overall declining sales there. For the remainder of this year, the H2, we expect some recovery, some bounce back. Um, however, for the overall uh, year 2020, we're still looking at uh, a volume drop of around 25%, I believe. And in terms of the longer term out outlook, so we're looking at you know electric vehicles flourishing, their, their relative market share increasing. Um, but again, that's within the context of overall passenger vehicle volumes taking until around 2026, in fact, to reach uh, previous pre-COVID 2019 volumes. Um, I think by around 2030, uh, EVs will account for around 25% of sales volumes. But by 2040, this is when it really happens, uh, we're looking at 95% of sales being EVs and PHEVs, essentially dominating the market because of um, governments essentially banning internal combustion engine vehicles for sale. Okay, so what this ultimately leads to is waiting lists. Um, and we've seen clear anecdotal examples of OEMs struggling with supply chain issues. So pre, even pre-COVID, Audi was uh, having issues with their supplier, LG Chem. Um, JLR also stopped production due to shortages. Uh, Mercedes also reportedly cut EQC production levels uh, due to shortages again from LG Chem. And I think post-COVID, even Tesla has reported um, sales being affected by battery supply shortages as they reopen their plants post-COVID. So there's a clear issue across the industry. Um, and the uh, Model 3, for example, um, has been the best-selling EV in Europe for quite a while now, but has actually been overtaken by the smaller um, Renault Zoe. There's a number of reasons for that, um, but we'll also come into that in a, in a moment. Now, average waiting times, according to our 
our research are typically around 13 weeks for electric vehicles and more like ice uh, seven eight weeks for ice vehicles and that difference seems to be accounted for by um, more ice vehicles being kept in stock at dealerships uh, whereas EVs are not generally so this unexpected surge which is you know it's a good problem to have of um, you know demand in, in EVs and PHEVs growing actually compounds the existing battery supply chain issues and shortages um, because essentially demand is outstripping supply so this demonstrates of course why battery supply chains are a key competitive advantage I'm sure Tesla would have loved to have sold more uh, Model 3s if they'd had sufficient battery supplies and kept their number one position in Europe so let's look at the battery supply chain so it is quite a complex um, chain um, people often think of it simply as the battery cell suppliers and the uh, OEMs but there's much more to it than that so if you start very much at the upstream you have the raw materials of um, you know uh, lithium, cobalt, nickel, man manganese, etc., copper as well, I believe. Um, and these are produced by a range of companies which most people have probably not heard of. Um, very much commoditized uh, mineral mining companies. And then you have the um, companies that produce the battery components. So this is the cathodes, the anodes, and the separators. Again, relatively unknown companies, and these tend to be... Um, located in in asia the next step is the um the actual battery cell manufacturers so these are more familiar names certainly within the industry you have the lg chems the panasonics the catls byd etc and they actually produce the individual cells um, which are slightly larger versions of your typical aa battery uh, but obviously a lot more powerful and advanced um, and then you have the battery pack assembly plant so this is the sort of intermediary between the cell manufacturer and the OEM so they arrange the cells into modules and then packs and then software and thermal systems are added to the batteries to control and monitor and regulate the system so it becomes a complete system that uh, is controlled for safety and, and performance reasons and then you have the um, the actual assembly plants, the, the the production lines for OEMs, all of the familiar names that we, we know of, um, and then the finished vehicles. But of course, there's one final step which is often forgotten about, which is what happens then to those batteries, the repurposing. So we're actually at an interesting crossroads with EVs right now because um, the first generation EVs around 10 years ago are starting to be decommissioned and and be uh, repurposed and recycled. Now this is important because um, this is where the open loop system, the theoretical model begins to work where the battery uh, components, the rare metals, the valuable parts of it are recycled and go back to the, the start of this process to produce that, that perfect closed loop system. And that's the, the, the theoretical goal. Um, but we're seeing shortages uh, primarily in the supply chain at the, the raw material level. So very much at the, the start of that supply chain. Um, also seeing them at the battery cell level. So the LG chems, the Panasonics, etc. cetera. Um, and that's then leading to supply bottlenecks at the finished vehicles. So you see how that, that whole chain is being held up by uh, one, two, or potentially three different parts of the supply chain, they're all absolutely critical to each other. Um, and But that upstream element is, is mainly the reason why we're having supply chain shortages right now, uh, shortages in materials. So one of the trends that is apparent is, is localization. So I mentioned just now that a lot of the battery supply chain is is highly regionalized so most of the raw materials and and the anodes and cathodes are produced in specific regions around the world um, that's fine you know when when ev volumes were low it made sense to import battery cells rather than build plants um, however as volumes are ramped up 
it makes much less sense to ship large volumes of heavy batteries all around the world. That's inefficient and costly. So more localization, and also known as nearshoring of battery plants, uh, is taking place. And this potentially shortens the supply chain distances. So we've seen that with LG Chem uh, opening plants in Poland, Ohio, US, CATL in Germany, Northvolt in Germany as a joint venture with VW, and SK Innovation with two plants in Georgia in the US. So these are key examples. However, the battery components, so the upstream parts, the anodes, the cathodes, are still going to be largely sourced from Asia. And the again, the raw materials will still be sourced from politically unstable regions, in particular um, cobalt from the DRC in Africa. So this creates a lot of challenges for inbound logistics, um, the accelerating EV and PHEV demand, the complexity of transporting batteries. I mentioned that it's not just complete battery packs. Sometimes they're transported as single cells, uh, modules or complete packs, but the complete pack is very heavy. It's typically 300 to 500 kilograms, and you can see why it's ineffective and, and costly to, to move those around in large volumes around the world. And of course, lithium ion batteries are defined in most regions as dangerous goods with restrictions on how they're transported. Um, and this varies enormously by region and jurisdiction. Now, there's also a, a shift in the industry from single sourcing to multi-sourcing. So uh, to mit mitigate those supply chain bottlenecks, OEMs have moved towards multi-sourcing. Uh, this gives uh, OEMs um, the opportunity to, to regionalize their suppliers, also for, for regional markets that are better suited to a particular type or cost of battery. Um, for example, Tesla um, used to primarily or almost exclusively use Panasonic for its batteries, um, but now it only uses them for North America and Europe. It, it uses some LG Chem batteries for Asian markets, and it uses CATL TL exclusively for China. Specifically because there was a, a regulation in China where China insisted that all electric vehicles sold in the country were uh, of Chinese origin, and CATL is a Chinese company. Uh, for, similarly, VW uses LG Chem, Samsung SDI, and SK, SKI, or SK Innovation for the Europe region, and CATL for China and SKI for North America from 2022. So they're diversifying their supply to uh, mitigate against supply shortages. So moving on, there's also a tendency and trend within the industry to uh, have joint ventures between OEMs and uh, battery cell manufacturers and suppliers. Now this gives many advantages. So you have a situation where the uh, OEMs can be you know, an exclusive uh, customer for that cell supplier. It also reduces the investment cost for that cell supplier uh, by sharing the burden. Um, but also in return, the OEM gets increased security of supplier. And you know, Tesla's Panasonic is, is a, a good example or exemplar of that relationship. However, for smaller startups that don't have that um, buying power, there is a move towards forming consortiums to achieve the same sort of buying power for batteries as with larger OEMs. So Fisker, for example, has, has got together with several other small startups to uh, purchase one million batteries uh, and share them out amongst the startups. So they, they're they able to compete on a level playing field. So here's, here's an example of, of those um, uh, groupings and joint ventures. Now, of course, for Finnish vehicle logistics, uh, EVs are typically heavier than equivalent ICE vehicles, around two to 300 kilograms. And that's gradually increasing that difference because of larger and larger batteries being fitted as, as prices fall. So that's a, a major factor. Um, the uh, charging infrastructure, of course, is, is a major issue uh, as EVs need to be delivered in a charge state either to delivery hubs or even the dealerships themselves. For road transportation, EVs reduce the load factor uh, as car carriers reach the weight limit before the, the space limit within the carrier. 
for rail. Uh, one of the major issues that's coming up is that China is still not accepting um, dangerous goods on trains within China. So EVs cannot be moved around across China. So road or sea, sea methods have to be used uh, within those Chinese borders. For shipping, um, row row vessels uh, obviously require EVs to be charged as they are driven on and off. Uh, and ports, of course, uh, increasingly are needing extensive charging infrastructure to support that growth in EVs. So the conclusions from our research are that uh, at the industry level, battery supply chains are very much central to the successful electrification of the, the vehicle fleet. Um, but at the company level, um, uh, it's critical that uh, they make a success of that. But post COVID, of course, the pace of EV adoption has accelerated significantly. Um, we're seeing uh, 20, 25% growth rates, as we indicated earlier. Um, but at, yeah, as I was saying, the, at the company level, efficient battery supply chains are becoming a clear competitive advantage in gaining market share, gaining penetration of these new electric and hybrid vehicles. And localization is increasing as electric vehicle volumes rise. And of course, what that means is that you have rapidly evolving supply routes changing constantly. And the increasing trend for OEMs to invest in joint ventures for battery plants with cell suppliers is a, a key industry issue right now. And to mitigate uh, battery supply chain bottlenecks, OEMs have generally moved from the single source to the multi-sourcing model as well. Therefore, exploiting the, the changes within the battery supply chain creates enormous business opportunities. So hopefully this presentation will highlight some of those uh, opportunities for you. So thank you for this presentation. Uh, here are current industry reports right now and potential future upcoming reports for you to read as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Again, fantastic insight there. Um, I hope, I think our, our audience has gotten a real sense of the, the, the complexity of that supply chain and the challenges that OEMs are facing um, as they try to keep up with this demand at the same time, of course, as, as dealing with such dramatic falls in the overall market. So quite a, quite a set of whiplash there. We don't have much time. In fact, we're pretty much out of time, because, but we need to, and we need to move on to some other sessions. Let's do a rapid fire question though. What about fuel cell? I mean, we see 95% by 2040, but do you see any scope that another technology might come and get in the way here a little bit? Uh, there will be a very minimal market share in fuel cells, but primarily that will be related to um, heavy goods vehicles where uh, battery electric vehicles uh, are just not viable. They would take up most of the, the trucks uh, carrying capacity, the size of battery necessary. The charging time would be a matter of days, I would imagine, <laughs> rather than hours. And it makes more sense for um, the the charging infrastructure for hydrogen, for um, logistics companies to perhaps have one at a depot, um, to roll out the charging infrastructure for hydrogen uh, across the country at the consumer, the passenger car level, would be massively expensive. Um, and the cost of fuel cell vehicles is still prohibitively high uh, for for consumer for passenger vehicles at least anyway. Okay, well, we may be out of time here, but the good news for our audience is that Daniel's going to be joining us in an upcoming session focused on scaling up the EV supply chain with a number of the another uh, other number of experts. So please join us there. And that's not the only EV and supply chain battery supply chain session we have. We're looking at FEL for EVs. We're looking at startup OEMs. Check the check your calendar. You can build your, your schedule there and uh, and tune in for a lot more insight where that came from. But Daniel, I want to thank you for the this excellent insight and and, and all this data and sharing for more. Um, thanks again to everyone for tuning in. Join us for the next session. I'm Christopher Ludwig at Ultima Media, powering off for now. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you.